don't believe that balance exists. I believe it's wholeness. I'm whole to begin with, but I I have work to do. Wholeness to me is being able to be your own bridge to your heart, through your heart. Scott Edgar lost his mom at the age of 10, suddenly and tragically. Currently, he is a successful attorney, newly divorced and dealing with trauma bonds, and beginning to uncover how the hurt and pain from the loss of his mom has impacted him for 39 years. We often misunderstand our pain, believing that our methods of pain relief are the cause of our problems. Scott has found healing in poetry. With words, he makes the unbearable beautiful, and he and us can find healing. Scott's book, My Mother Sleeps, can be found on Amazon, and be sure to catch his podcast, The Poet Delayed. Each episode revolves around one of his poems, and I was blessed to be a guest. I was grateful to spend time in Scott's home, and I hope you enjoy this poetically raw episode with Scott Edgar. I've found that as I've been writing poetry, like as I try to convey or work through ideas, concepts, emotions, poetically, mm-hmm. you know, through metaphor, simile, whatever, as I try to put those on paper, try to work them through, it helps me understand more of these, these difficult concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, you know, just finding, coming at a thing from a different angle. Mm-hmm. And thinking, how can I express this in a way that's, uh, artistic almost you know yep. it says it but it doesn't say it mm-hmm. and when I do that as I've done that there have been many instances in which I've come to an understanding a realization that um, almost like I had these ideas these kind of feelings in my mind about what it was and then as I've tried to implement them I think okay I understand yeah. that principle more now one of those was a poem that I wrote for my mom uh, well about her death it's called a subtle wound and it, you know, so my mom died in 1984. I went to bed when I was, so I was 10 years old. Mm-hmm. I, it was a Sunday night. I went to bed like every other night. And then my dad woke me and my siblings up at midnight and told us that, you know, someone in our family had to go away for a while. Mm-hmm. Your mom's dead. And so, and then we didn't really talk about her death. Mm. I don't know that we ever talked about her death, frankly, wow. when I was a kid. And so, um... I, I was trying to, uh, and, and the other aspect, you know, and we'll, I'm going to read this poem in a second, is that I, I, I didn't feel like anything had happened. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I had been impacted negatively. I felt fine. Mm-hmm. You know, or I thought I felt fine. Mm-hmm. And I made a point of it growing up to try to say that, you know, my mom's death didn't impact me, which, you know, obviously is ridiculous Mm -hmm. but I tried to because I wanted to be accountable for my decisions and Mm -hmm. I didn't want people to think I was making excuses and so I went out of my way to say oh it's not my mom's death Mm -hmm. but anyway so as I've gone through this healing process I've started to understand yeah Mm -hmm. that kind of that that hit hard yeah hard you don't come out of that no nobody comes out of that unscathed (laughs) no um so let me read the poem to you and there's a specific line in here that really helped me not just in this instance but in you know as I go forward in life Mm -hmm. to have uh to just to have a better understanding but so the poem reads again it's it's called uh it's titled a subtle wound Mm -hmm. and the poem reads you left me when my world was measured by a child's stride you had to go away for a while I was told to ease me into the truth you were gone and not coming back it was involuntary I know you're leaving But intent is not part of trauma's calculus, so I was not spared, though the wound went unnoticed. There was no nervous response or reflexive recoil, as when you touch a hot pan. It was subtle, no bleeding, no blistered flesh, just a change in routine and one less setting at the table. Mm. And the line that I worked on in this so hard was this, it was involuntary, I know, Mm -hmm. you're leaving but intent is not part of trauma's calculus. Mm-hmm. And to understand that, you know, I, I've had to deal with, uh, you know, in, in, you know, in my therapy, you know, yeah. like talking to Jackie, 
she helped me understand that um, perhaps I have hard feelings towards my mom mm-hmm. because she left. Like mm-hmm. as a 10-year-old boy, yeah. I know it was involuntary. Yep, yep, yep. yep. But as a 10-year-old boy, there's a feeling of abandonment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, she's gone. Mm-hmm. You know, and and it's not that I feel like she did it on purpose. Right. But still, that's in me. And regardless of the fact that it was involuntary, mm. you can still be hurt and traumatized by involuntary actions. Yes. And for me, that helps me check my actions. Yeah. What am I doing? Mm-hmm. Who am I interacting with? Mm-hmm. What impact is this going to have on them? Mm-hmm. Because... I mean, invariably we're going to traumatize. People will be traumatized or we yeah. will hurt people invariably. And even if we don't mean to, you know, the important thing is to, uh, the important thing is, you know, to recognize it and to apologize and, and you know, and, and make amends where you can. Mm-hmm. But just to know that, yeah, people are going to be hurt just by the process of me living my life. Yeah. Well, and, and to understand there's trauma or traumatizing events, mm-hmm. which are the things that happen. And then there's trauma that's your body response. And your body's response or that trauma that's inside your body isn't under your control. That isn't, that's, right. that's the involuntary, right. you know, like your reaction. You, you don't have a, you don't have a choice in how your systems of your body respond to a traumatic event and what may be traumatic for one person isn't traumatic for the other, you know, Mm -hmm. but even to your point of even, I think a child losing a mom or a parent is probably on this short list of really traumatic things, right? Really traumatic things. And yet even there was still some pressure on you to try and make it okay, you know, to try and make it, um, to try and force to have, to not have a response that anybody would, you know, we, we, that's the positive, the toxic positivity, you know, right. sides of things where it's like, Oh, well, she was better off somewhere or right. things like that, 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 right. that discount your response that try and make you say your response is wrong. You know, that your hurt is right. wrong in, in some ways we do that so much. It's a shame. Yeah. Like, in, well, the, you know, I wrote another poem called On Becoming a Black Hole in which I kind of address what you just said. Like, because like, a lot of people say, well, you know, God must have really needed your mom. Yeah, ouch. Yeah. You know, and as a kid, I, I understand their, their, what they're trying to do. Right. Um, but when you think about, when I think about it, um, it's, it's, uh, I think about what they're trying to say. Yeah. And that's another thing. Maybe it's involuntary. They're not trying. You know, right. They're not trying to. But it's really not very thoughtful. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and as a little kid, I thought, okay. You know, and as I've thought about it now, as I get older, I think, what, really? You, mm-hmm. you know? And so I wrote this poem called I'm Becoming a Back Black Hole, mm-hmm. which is, a, a you know, I parallel the birth and death of a star to my kind of rebirth the night my mom died. Wow. Um, and through the death, but I, uh, the poem is sort of autobiographical, mm-hmm. except I'm not going to become a mm-hmm. black hole. Right. I, I branch off, but the poem mm-hmm. itself carries through as if that individual, um, becomes a black hole. Mm-hmm. But in that poem, you know, in that, when I'm writing about my rebirth, mm-hmm. I said, uh, I mean, I'll just read the, so it's, there's a, there is, um, a prologue and then four parts and then an epilogue. Okay. And the part two, I'll just read that part of it. It says, uh, in the darkness, the boy closed his eyes and sleep came to him as death and it brought death before his eyes opened again. And in the same darkness, while the sun burned low beneath the horizon, he learned of it. She was not coming home and the darkness moved into him. And it was heavy and expanded, full of confusion and death. And he was conceived in that darkness to be born again, but not of water or of the spirit. And in his core, it incubated in the place where fear hurts him. In embryo, it waited his new self for the boy to lay it down, his old self. But in that moment, the crush of the expanding darkness was repelled 
by the oblivion of his grief and tears in a tenuous equilibrium. But his ears were filled with sadness and nothing else, and through his salty vision the boy looked around and saw the sadness. There were so many tears, and he saw them all, but only a few hands to wipe them away. And those hands were earnest, too, in explaining the mysteries of God. He needed her, so God took her away. But in his confusion, but his confusion only grew heavier because he needed her too and had no other options. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it kind of addresses that 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 point. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. Uh, another poem that I that was a real kind of a, an epiphany to me. It actually was a poem that I wrote. So I have a nephew who passed away on the 4th of July this last year. He was 21, or just a few days short, shy of his 21st birthday. He just mm. died in his sleep. Mm. And it, as you can imagine, it's mm. jarring. Yeah. And he was just a, a brilliant boy, mm. kind, and just just the light of people's life. Always mm-hmm. seemed to be positive. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and in writing the poem, I there's a concept, an idea that had come to me and, and when it came to me, it was almost like, it was almost like a flash of revelation, and I just got overwhelmed. Wow! And just started crying. But mm-hmm. Let me find this poem for you, and it's called, uh, it's called "You Break Darkness," mm-hmm. and it's the last few verses that um, contain that kind of. Aha mm. type moment. Mm-hmm. So it's you break darkness. It reads, those were not, f- so again, he passed away on the 4th of July. His birthday was the 10th of mm-hmm. July, but he passed away on the 4th. Those were not for you that patriotic night, those percussive explosions of light, the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air that broke the dark night sky and shined on the faces of multitudes. But they could have been. You blonde-haired, blue-eyed, all-American boy, but they could have been. Mm. They weren't launched into the night as a tribute to you, but forgive those who might think otherwise, because you were light, and you broke darkness too, and shined on the faces of multitudes. But the parallels stop there, and they are only surface. Your light never faded. It was constant, not like the burning elements in the sky that night. Their light was brilliant, but momentary. But you, our blonde-haired boy, you burned like you were fusing hydrogen in your core. You burned like a star, Mm -hmm. as a beacon in darkness for all to see. But your work was never in mass, not for a crowd of people thronging and pressing about you. Instead, you, our blue-eyed boy, you sensed the single touch on the hem of your garment, then turned to seek out the individual. So those communal lights were not for you that night, as bright and brilliant as they were in their brevity. They were insufficient to commemorate you, and we would have rejected them as such. But even more, we were not ready for you to go. And those lights in the sky were meaningless to us. Instead, we want dark nights and dark skies that contain you and flesh and blood so we can see you and feel you. But you are gone, our blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy. Too soon, too soon, too soon. And our nights are darker now. And darkness is not in the skies only anymore. It drips in our hearts like black, heavy tar that won't wipe off. It fills our minds like black storm clouds that pour rain from our eyes, down our searching faces, searching for you. And we have dark nights ahead and dark days to match. But you are gone. Our blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy who broke darkness, we laid you down, and there is no end to them, it seems. The nights have been quiet since you left, and darker, and the black sky is broken by the stars now, the constant stars. But that's false. It's not the stars we see. They do not move in our space. Instead, we see memories of those faraway stars, memories of moments in each star's existence, communicated in waves of light. And as each star runs its course, when each star dies, even then, those waves of light will not stop. They will come to us still and break the black sky still and bring memories ad infinitum, it seems, of the brilliant brightness of their source. And you burned like a star in life, but are gone. You no longer move in our space, not in flesh and blood anyway. But we sense you still. You move in our memories now, and they are full of light, 
and we understand now. The light you shined in life, it was never extinguished. It shines brightly still. But now, in waves of memory, reminding us of the brilliant brightness of its source, you, our blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy, who breaks darkness still. Mm. And the, the concept that I had was that, that of stars. You know, mm-hmm. when you see stars, you don't see the star, you're seeing a mm. memory, right. effectively, of that star yeah. from that moment. Yes. And so just like that, some of those stars are likely dead, gone, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but we still see them as if yes. they are existing. And so he is not with us anymore, Yeah. but his memory comes to us as light. His light even, yeah. And it shines in our life mm-hmm. still as if he were here, even mm-hmm. though he's not. And you know, that, that idea, that concept, when I, I just thought, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the same with it. You know, we, with everybody. Yeah. When we're working toward like feeling whole, you know, we are whole, but to feel whole is a different thing, right? Mm-hmm. We, we do what as a practitioner, my goal is to process emotions. So it's not like we, or, or experiences, we don't cut them out and pretend yeah. like they didn't exist. We process. And so that's why I wanted to talk to you because I think in creating a poem, you can't help but processing the experience as you put it to words yes. and come up with the right thing to say. And, and just like you said, to say it, but not say it, you yeah. know? Uh, so I see that as so, so healing um, that process and, and that, that that speaks to you, I think is, is so excellent. And you are an attorney by day, I would say, and a poet all the time. Yeah, good way to say it. But I wanted to ask you about how was that like? And I know you talked about it in a previous episode. I had this written down before I listened to the episode in your podcast, The Poet Delayed. Mm -hmm. Um, But this is an episode, I Am a Poet. You talked about how how was taking on that title of poet? A poet. How? What was that like to say I am a poet? Especially in contrast to this attorney, yeah. <laughs> attorney by day. Well, how was that? You know, attorneys. It's a it's a writing career. We write a lot. Yeah, true. But um, it's boring usually. <laughs> Although I, I do find great satisfaction in crafting a well written, well logical argument. Great. Yeah, you know? your your words are probably really they're powerful. Yeah, but yeah. You know, I've always had a difficult time. I never wanted to call myself a poet because I felt pretentious. Like, well, I'm not a poet. You know, poets mm-hmm. are like, um, you know, Frost or, yeah. or Shakespeare, you know, Thoreau even, or, you know, um, Tennyson. They're Which poets. you always loved your whole life. I've right? always been drawn to poetry. Yeah. Always been drawn to poetry. Um, and so I always felt like, ah, this sounds weird to say I'm a poet. Almost, you know. It's weird. I'm a, I'm a movie star. You know, it's yeah, weird, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. But I am a poet. Yeah. I write poetry. I, you know, I've got my book and yeah. I, I am a poet. And, and yeah. I, I see the world through, I see the world, like the way I see the world, I would say, is poetically, not, mm-hmm. I mean, not like, not in, uh, necessarily beautiful way always but i see it in analogy and metaphor my yeah. mind is always converting things into analogy and metaphor and and, and trying to understand things that way and mm-hmm. um and i love i i love to take a thing and and write about it in a way that is unique mm-hmm. and and to come up you know I, so i've so yeah I, so it's been nice to to take upon myself that, you know, that, yeah, I'm a poet. Trying it on. I think it's, you know, I think anybody that's listening will listen to those poems that you write and just say, yeah, he's a poet. And it doesn't have any impact within ourselves. There's no discomfort within us, mm. you know. But isn't that how it is in lots of things we were talking about when we were recording your podcast about people and their divinity, their 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 wholeness, you know, it's it's like you can look at someone else and you be like, yeah, it's fine. I don't have any. But when we to take upon that name ourselves brings up all sorts of like I don't know. And so how can we borrow from other people? You know their um, their confidence in that in that um, you know to me that's the the help that we give each other is it's like you know I have no reservations inside of me to call you a poet. Mm. 
And so maybe you could borrow from, from me, yeah. you know what I mean? That's where we're connected and that type of thing, if that makes sense. It does. I think really though, for me, what the key is for me at least mm-hmm. is we kind of talked about this in my podcast as well yeah. is um, connecting to yourself and accepting yourself yes and and not worrying about because the reason i'm hesitant to call myself a poet yeah. is because well people are going to think I, i'm crazy you right know? ben franklin has this great quote he said uh, <laughs> um the eyes of other people are the eyes that ruin us mm. if all but myself were blind I should want neither fine clothes, fine houses, nor fine furniture, mm. you know, and to analogize that over, I mean, that was, you know, I, I didn't feel confident in myself. Mm-hmm. I, I felt, uh, less than, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, and so for me, you know, the, the more connected I am to myself, mm-hmm. the more confidence I have in accepting my strengths Mm. and um you know kind of we talked about this concept of um believing that we're worthy to be loved yeah and i think it's the same thing yeah you know i i understand that people deserve to be loved Mm -hmm. i get that Mm -hmm. but for me it's uncomfortable when Mm. people express love and care and concern for me and, and give me attention. It's, un, it's uncomfortable mm-hmm. because I, I, you know, you know, my childhood wounds and, and mm-hmm. so forth were such that they led me to feel like I want to avoid chaos. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to cause anybody problems. And so I'm just going to withdraw. And as a result of that, I, I never felt like I was worth the mm-hmm. time. And so, mm-hmm. I think for me, part of the the uh, the ability to to claim that title as a poet is that to see myself for who I am, mm-hmm. and to understand you know that I I have strengths, mm-hmm. and I deserve to be loved, and you know I, I just there's no reason to um, dismiss myself. Mm-hmm. And when was your, so when was your book published? Uh, beginning, uh, or I think beginning of June last year. Okay. And you can get it on Amazon. Yeah. Or, Amazon and King's English and Salt Lake. Salt Lake. And so, but at, knowing you, I know, so we've got these two, this, this kind of dichotomy because you, you've had the rough last year mm-hmm. and yet at the same time you've opened yourself up to putting your poetry out there because I think you didn't, you didn't share it with too many people. Yeah. I, I, before. I yeah, I used to never share my poetry. I, I felt, um, that it was attention seeking if I were to share my poetry, mm-hmm. you know, I wanted to, mm-hmm. but I thought it was improper to want to share my poetry. Do you think it was because you know, I mean, and if we could put judgment on it, we don't want to, but people might put, people would put judgment on it. My old self would have put judgment on it, but it's like that true part of you, that, that, that highest self of you, that divine self knew it was good. You knew you're a good poet. Well, I'll say this. And so it's like, if I put it out there, I'm showing off a little bit. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't want to bring attention to myself. Right. Um, like, Another instance of that is like I was uh, in uh, the band The Killers. I was in one of their music videos. Oh, yeah. I was cast as a lead in that, and I've never spoken. I, I, I so it was in November of 2017, mm-hmm. and I never spoke of it mm-hmm. until recently. I just thought, you know what, that was pretty dang cool. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't. I mean, to be in a a, a music video of like a, a big band. Um, but I would never speak of it cause I didn't want to bring attention to myself. Right. Part of it was because I was shamed by, you know, some people close by me, like mm-hmm. almost trying to, I look back now and I think there's maybe some jealousy there, you know, or maybe yeah. some, and so they would shame me like, you know, you're just doing this for attention, whatever, yeah. you know? And, but you know, I don't go out of my way to, you know, tell, I, I love to shit, you know, I, cause I think it's cool. Yeah. You know? Right. It, and we all do that, don't we? We all think somehow that if we are small, somehow that's yeah. more humble. Somehow that that's 
kind. But what if, you know, what if that's not true? What if if we stood in our greatness and declared it, that allowed other people to stand in their greatness and declare it? It's not the, it's not in contrast or in comparison. Mm-hmm. There, there's that's we don't have to have one or the other. That's a scarcity model. Abundance model means everybody gets a hundred percent. In fact, a fairness model divides it fairly. An abundance model, everyone gets everything. Yeah, it does no good. I I believe this, and I'm still trying to incorporate it in my life. But I believe right. that um, making ourselves small. Mm-hmm. serves no good purpose for anybody yeah. at all, except for maybe people who want to, except for maybe people who um, are jealous of us and they want to lord over us. Yes. Um, you know, I, I shared this quote in my, in our pod, in my podcast earlier, uh, that Nietzsche quote where he says that verily I laugh at the weaklings who consider themselves good, but have no claws. Mm-hmm. And I, I think about that, you know, basically, if you don't have the power, if you don't have the capacity to, to cause destruction, it's no virtue if you don't cause destruction. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think about that and I think that, well, there's a lot of people who have, I mean, you, we hear about meekness, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't, and people want to be meek and they want to be humble. It's almost become like, it's almost like sometimes you hear this preach like you, you, you know, don't, 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 you know, don't be angry. I mean, we mm-hmm. talk about this. Anger is not necessarily bad. Mm-hmm. And it's it's mm-hmm. an emotion. It's there for a reason. Right. Um, but, you know, w- when people preach meekness, where you just got to, uh, I'm trying to, way to. Yeah, well, like we, also, we often think of meekness and as weakness. Weakness, yes. And so it's almost, a, it's almost as if, you know, people who maybe are afraid will preach, this is the virtue. You mm-hmm. need to be meek and weak. Mm-hmm. And then these stronger people like, oh, okay, I'll, uh, you know, almost, strength is um, a sin almost, mm-hmm. you know? And power is not the problem. Right. It's power over or power under. Mm-hmm. And we often, we have this thought, this idea that somehow we have to be in a power over and a power under. And we right. meet someone and within a split second, we've de- we've decided who gets to be the power over and who gets to be the power under. But if we just move into power, full, just true power, power, we all can be powerful. But I can't do it, do it for you and you can't do it for me. I can't, I can't ask you to, to convey or to, um, to to tell me I'm powerful. I, I have to figure right. that out for myself. And, right. and I think in order to get to that point of power, we've got to do some looking at, at our wounds and, and, and those kind of things. And, and that's what you're doing with your poetry. You're looking right. at those kind of things and processing through so that they become a power source instead of a draining source. Right. And the goal of all healing, I, I believe, mm-hmm. is to reconnect with ourselves. I agree. And when you reconnect with yourself and you have an understanding of your true value and, and that, that it is inherent, that is not dependent on a third party is not dependent right. on somebody else's definition of what is good. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the right to make the determination of what is valuable and important in our lives. Mm-hmm. And, you know, some people may try to nullify our, our worth by defining worth in certain ways mm-hmm. you see it all the time with you know wealth and you know social media i mean people you know the people on social media i mean the influencers are they're the ones who are advocating lifestyles and things mm-hmm. like that but lifestyle doesn't necessarily add value to your life mm-hmm. maybe comfort but not right. value to who right. you are um so when we connect with ourselves, my, my understanding, my feeling is when I connect with myself, when anybody connects with who they are and, and gains a, an understanding of their inherent inalienable value mm-hmm. and worth, then they have the ability to move forward in life and, and, and risk and they're not risk averse because they know that nothing that happens is going to impact that. Mm. Nothing somebody says right. is going to impact that because it's so easy to hear what people are saying, hear critical comments about yourself and to 
shy away from stuff. Right. I remember when I was in probably eighth grade, I was in this class, and I had written on my paper, I did an assignment, and I had to go to the reverse side of the paper. So at the bottom, in parentheses, I wrote over, as I like flip the page over, you know? Mm-hmm. And the teacher of that class was handing out all the papers. And I don't think he said my name specifically, but he held my paper up, and I remember him shaking it, like, you don't have to do this. You don't have to write over. I can figure it out myself. Ooh. I felt like... Right. I felt worthless. I like, oh, And I, I was afraid to go into this class for the rest of the year. Wow. You know, and I, I just think, had I had a better sense of myself, mm. I would be like, who cares, you know? Right. And, but I didn't. And so that was really hard for me. And I just, I just think, what if everybody had a sense of who they are? Yeah. This world, I mean, you, I mean, it's, that's obviously uh, <laughs> never going to happen. Yeah. But if we did, I mean, it just would be amazing. It, it, well, and the sad thing is, is that it, it gets lost. That's mm, the thing. Yeah. It, it, it gets, it, because if I, I've used this analogy before, if you go into a, a room of kindergartners and you ask them, who here can draw? Almost every hand would go up. Mm-hmm. I can draw. Yeah. You go into an adult and ask that same question, you've got two or three people that can raise their hand because we've judged what it means to be. Yeah. We've judged the difference. We've, we've decided what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But that younger self, that innocent, that childlike self... It, because it doesn't have that comparison it it's more connected to the self it just says i can you know for me that's where i'm trying to get back to because what i think stands in between in between being able to just raise my hand and be enough right first of all there are the, to to understand the wounds and the stories that have happened to cause the disconnect mm-hmm. from that also to understand that the, the real difference between me and there is really when it comes down to the very bottom of that journey it is a it is sensations in the body because that discomfort you know is really that yucky feeling in your usually in your stomach mm-hmm. or maybe maybe in your chest and what if i can be, when I know the hurts, I got to know the hurts. Otherwise, I'm bypassing. If I'm just if I'm just numbing them off, right. I'm not. That's not what we want. So I need to hold the pain for a minute, and 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 treat it like my little child, you know, and work through it. Then I can, you know, gently practice feeling that sensation, and and holding compassion for it instead of it sending me in 50 different directions you know because it is essentially a sensation in my body and I want that sensation to tell me it's truth rather than rather than what most of us do is it's like I gotta shut that down Yeah. when I, when I started thinking of the pain in my body mm-hmm. is just that mm-hmm. like you know uh, being able to like experience it yeah. as opposed to be controlled by it right and, still working on it for but, sure me but too. to be able to like have this discomfort come in and yes. say okay high discomfort high discomfort that part of my body yeah what is that you know yeah. because the fact of the matter is I'm not gonna die yeah it's not gonna I mean I'm not in danger yeah you know uh, a lot of that fear and those I'm understanding now whatever's triggering it now mm-hmm. is come you know it's, it's, it's from my prior experience right. so this right now like whatever I do in this situation right now, this specific situation, yeah. isn't necessarily going to impact that. Like, right. um, so I, I just got divorced recently and I still struggle with the pain of mm-hmm. separation. Mm-hmm. And part of me thinks every now and then I'm just like, I just want to go back. Mm-hmm. I just want to go back. Yeah. And I think that's going to fix it. Mm-hmm. But I know. Mm-hmm. That's not going to fix it. It, yeah. it. You know, we got divorced for a reason. Yeah. It wasn't just fly by night, let's just be done. Right. There was a reason, and it was a good reason. Yeah. And I know that going back, things are not have not changed and they won't change. Yeah. And so in my mind now, when those thoughts come to me, I think, okay, I have to remind myself, this pain that I'm feeling now, mm-hmm. number one, 
it's not unique to this situation. I felt it at other times in my life. Mm-hmm. And, and what I've done is I've processed, well, where are other times in my life that I felt it? You know, and, and I've gone and I've recognized those mm-hmm. times that I felt it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, okay, I get this pain now. Mm-hmm. But I also know that going back, mm-hmm. it may relieve this anxiety that I feel right now. Right. But it's not going to fix it because the problem right. is not there. Right. The, my, my target should not be going back to my ex-wife. The target should be going in and reconnecting yes. the fracture inside of me. That's how I heal this pain not going there. Right. And so understanding the source of the pain, understanding what the pain is, and also knowing that, just reminding myself that it's going to be okay. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Just that. That, for me, has been um, really powerful for me. Yeah. I, I've... Uh, it's your practice for the last year. Yeah. Yeah. And it very well may be for a long time because that pain is pretty persistent. Yeah. You know? It's like it's like there's there's a puzzle piece and you can't put just any old you know, you can't just say, Well, there's a puzzle piece, that's I'm gonna fit it in there. It's right. got to be the correct puzzle right. piece. But I you know, thinking in this moment, I I I because we've talked about this before and I, I totally understand that and I thought, I wonder if he knows what so well, the way you look at metaphors, life through metaphors and things, some things that will come up to me are spectrums. And I think, okay, on one spectrum of in the spectrum of what you've been going through, you're over here where it's like, I wanna go back, I wanna go back, and then on the other hand would be like, F her, you know. <laughs> And I just, so it, it's like, it's as tender as it is and how much heartache it has brought you. To me, I see those perspectives and I think, wow, that, that comes from a tender place. Do you know what I mean? That, that, that I, I've always had respect for the fact, you know, I would not like you as much if you were clear on the other end <laughs> yeah. of the spectrum, right? So you're here and we just want to pull, you know, a little further away, you know, because we, we don't want you to go to the opposite. Right. We just want you to move into, and that where, where you would say, I would say the center, or, and maybe that's further this way for some people, maybe that's for, but what it is, is it's, it's the self. It's actually the true, the true self somewhere along that, that spectrum. I think we get hurt and have problems when we're at either end of the yeah. extreme spectrum. Well, what I find is, um, I think at both ends of the, the spectrum, mm-hmm. those are based in fear. I, I that's a really good Yeah. Like point. when I want to go back, yes, it's when the pain hurts and I have no sense of like my sense of self. It's almost yeah. like, you know, my my desire to go back mm-hmm. is directly proportional to my my fear or lack of connection to myself. Yeah, but when I'm connected to myself, there are moments when I it all makes sense. Yeah, and I think this is the right place for me to be. Yeah, and. I, I don't, I don't, frankly, I don't ever feel F her. I, mm-hmm. I don't ever get there. Right. It's either I, it's pain and I miss her or this is the right place right. for me to be. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fear. Mm-hmm. That's, I'm operating out of fear when I, when I f- have this panic, this, this, it's not even panic. It's just, it's, it's pain Mm -hmm. and I just want to go back Mm -hmm. but I know that that's when I don't have a connection to myself and Mm -hmm. so I know that now yeah and so that's you know the other thing is you know understanding that the pain is not just related to her right diagnosing it that way helps me Mm -hmm. to be able to then go and address it properly in an effective impact you know an effective way I think I can tell that you that's how I can tell you've done the work it's because because when we're in a state, and I've been there too, you know, we were over here, and so we most likely jump to the other end of the spectrum yeah. in order to counteract it. But see, the fact that you now have at least a sense of yourself, so you know, you know where actually you fit on that spectrum. And when you're at your best, that's where you land. That's where you feel most powerful. That's where you feel the most control. That's where you feel the most peace. Yes. Because you found where what fits for you. Because it's neither this nor that. It's somewhere in between. This poem kind of illustrates like s- some growth where mm-hmm. I'm at. Okay. Um, it's called Terrible Potential. I actually did a podcast on it. Ooh. And it's so... I love this one. Yeah, this is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. So it reads, I see it now. 
For years, I only sensed it or saw the dissipating dust tails of its approach. But it filled me with terror, and there was no cover or protection, so I ran. As fast as my child strike could take me, not even knowing what it was, only that it was coming. But that made the fear so much more in my little mind, so I ran harder until I forgot why I was running, only knowing that I couldn't stop. Mm. But I see it now. Its shape is fluid and undefined, and its terrible potential fills my mind. I want to keep running, retreating, but it won't stop, and it's closing the gap, and it's more terrible than I ever thought. But it's real. I see it now, and I know there's no escape. There never was. But I want to keep running anyway until it overtakes me. I won't see it coming. It'll just happen and be done. But my insufficient legs refuse to carry me anymore, so I prostrate myself as an offering. I know you're coming, I whisper, and I offer myself willingly. This is not defeat, I reassure myself, then lower my eyes and brace for its fury. But my mind keeps moving defiantly. It knows truths that my body forgot and reminds me, you were born with claws and they're with you still. And I remember and feel them. They are deep, but I feel them and they are there. So I raise my body from the dirt and my eyes to the distance. It is closer now, the gap disappearing, but not my fear. My fear is growing broadcast loudly by my beating heart. But I no longer want to run, nor offer myself willingly. Instead, I watch it come, and I wait, in fear true, but I wait to receive it, and I steady myself. I have claws, and I feel them, Mm -hmm. and I will meet it face to face. I have terrible potential too. I feel it now. So that's kind of Mm -hmm. the process where I've come to, you know, I'm, I'm still scary. Yeah. It's still hard, but I'm understanding who I am and mm-hmm. what my potential is. Not just my potential, but who I am now. Mm-hmm. And that is giving me the strength to be able to stand yeah. and to face it rather than running, 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 running. running, running, running. And I love you so going back to your quote about the, like without yeah. claws and you're saying, no, I'm going to have claws. Yeah. That's not a better virtue to, to have no claws. That's no. not a better virtue. That just, that just makes you vulnerable. Yeah. To we have a cat, and and they get cats get declawed, and they the, the the vet was like, "Is your does your cat go outside?" And we said, "Yeah, we have a doggy door, so he'll go out the doggy door as if it's you know just his door, his little yeah, his yeah. little little door." And he said, "Yes." He says, "Well, we're not going to take his claws out. Then he'll get hurt. He he will be too vulnerable out in the world. So they're not they're not terrible." Mm. Well, and I like the word terrible. Yeah. Has multiple meanings. Yes. It's it's terribly great. Terribly great. Yeah. I mean, it's great and it magnificent. Yes. It's like ah, huge. Yeah. yeah. But it's also horrible. Right. It's also bad. It's also like uh, not good. Yeah. And and the older we get, those those complexities of those paradoxes are where that's the to me that's the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Paradox is where it's it's the spectrum. It's being in the middle of two different. Um, end posts and that's where we find our, like ourselves like I say because yeah. usually someone else has given us one po- one or the other you know some either we've decided one for ourselves and someone else has handed them sometimes somebody's handed us both ends of those we only find ourselves somewhere in the middle and people will call it like black and white there's black and there's white and and that, so the people will say and I've even said to myself well I'm more of a gray person mm-hmm. and yet one day I sat there and I'm like you know what sits between black which is the absorption of all the colors and Presence. white which is the re- yeah, reflection is every color in between it's actually the entire rainbow the entire spectrum yeah. exists between those two so why wouldn't I want to live somewhere there yeah. full of color than in either ends of the spectrum but Interesting. both of the spectrum are necessary the black and the white are just a reflection or an absorption of everything they're not it doesn't get rid of it like we talked right. about with with wholeness it doesn't it's not the opposite it, it's just both yeah it's just where it sits on the spectrum yeah, that's interesting but what you've also started to do and it, i don't know maybe it's not the beginning but you've started to look at and do some calligraphy how has that been it's been great yeah you know, i've i've been writing haikus and then i will you know do them in calligraphy and mm-hmm. and uh uh, my favorite thing to do lately is I'll, I'll 
take somebody that I know and I'll write a personalized haiku for them. Yeah. You know, as you know, a thank you for something or yeah. And that's that's been very enjoyable. In fact, I'd like to publish a book of haikus mm. and then set myself up now. But uh, what I'd like to do <laughs> is each page have the haiku in type, but then I also have an image oh, of wow. the haiku in calligraphy. Okay. Yeah, and so, I love that. Yeah. You know, when Brene Brown, mm-hmm. in her famous first TED Talk, and she talks about her little breakdown, you know, I mm-hmm. don't know if you've ever seen it, but, you know, she was a researcher, and she, out of her research came, there's these people, and, and they, that were wholehearted, she called them. I think you could say they were connected to themselves, right? So when she looked at these people, these are people that are connected with themselves. What do they have in common? And there was 10 things. Like, that was one of the things they were creative and she really struggled with that because that wasn't, you know, like she was an academic, you know, yeah. you're an attorney. What's create, you know, what's this? She like, I'm going to go to craft class or whatever. But because of that, that's why I even wanted to talk to you because I want this, that creativity is such a vital part of being connected to the self that um, I think it's worth having a conversation about about how that has been a journey to, to healing. Yeah. I I've been, I was creative before I was a lawyer. Mm. A lawyer is for me, it's a good way to make a living. And you know, the title of my podcast is a poet delayed. That's right. And the reason why is because I shut the creativity down for a while mm-hmm. because I had such a hard time. Like I didn't know what was going on mm-hmm. inside of me. All I knew is I, I just kind of shut down. And so for years, years, Mm -hmm. I didn't write poetry. In fact, even when I did write poetry back in the day, it wasn't authentic poetry. Mm. It was poetry that I was writing. I I, I was writing poetry that I thought other people wanted to hear. Mm. Like it would end in a positive Ah. thing, you know? Yeah. And it wasn't until the last three years or so that I started really writing what I feel. Mm. And so I've always loved poetry. I've mm-hmm. always loved art. I've always loved creativity. Yeah. Oh, I've always been drawn to it. But I've never allowed myself to really open up mm-hmm. into the last few years. And it, as I've done that, though, it's it's been enormously healing for mm-hmm. me. You know, the process, like we talked about earlier, the process of... <laughs> The process of, got little kids running around in my house here. That's the ambient noise you listeners may hear. My little kids. We love it. it. Yeah, I love it. We love it. Um, But just the process, you know, the process of writing the poetry, working through the ideas and concepts, but also the accomplishment. Yeah. The accomplishment of writing a poet or, or doing calligraphy. In fact, sometimes when I can't sleep, I'll lay there and I will close my eyes and just imagine mm-hmm. myself writing calligraphy mm-hmm. like for me it was a matter of i didn't have the you know i i just had to turn it all off i got mm-hmm. to the point where i just thought you know what if i could just get to the point in my life where i wake up go do my job come home and basically just shut my emotions off mm-hmm. i thought then i can get through life mm-hmm. no one more i mean that's not a right that's not, life, that's not living but i think to some extent you know, it's easy to shut ourselves off when when we are in pain, just to stop the pain. Yes. I think, you know, I, I shut down. What did I shut down? I shut down the way I see the world, the way I I see the world through, through maybe you could say spiritual eyes or you could say I see things on a spiritual level, the 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 other side the the veil is is thin for me i shut that down Mm -hmm. because because number one just like you i could see people on tv and theirs was much stronger than mine or theirs was much bigger you know they they could just turn it on like a switch i didn't have that Mm -hmm. so i must not you know i'm not going to call myself a poet (laughs) you know just like you said i'm not going to call myself whatever they are and i loved um there's a famous quote, everybody, it's like famous by um, Marianne Williams in her, her book, Return to Love. And she says, our, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear 
is that we are powerful beyond measure. Yeah. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. You know, it is our it is our greatness. It is our our that divinity is way more terrifying to step into and to accept than I am a bad person. We kind of just allow that so much easier for some reason. Well, I think I know for me, I mean, yeah. it's, it's like in those superhero movies with, I think it was Spider-Man with great power comes great responsibility. Yes. And well, it, well, it is true in the sense that you, uh, you know, you're held responsible for your actions. But for me, it was easier to check out mm-hmm. because then I, I didn't have to make decisions. Mm. You know, I, I, I could just sit back and right. I was, it was decided. It was decided. I couldn't, yes. I mean, there's no hope. I was horrible. So why even right. try, you know, there's no shame in not trying, but when I have potential, yeah. when I have terrible potential, yeah. when I have the ability to make an impact and to make a change mm-hmm. and I don't, yeah, that's a problem. Mm, yeah, totally. So I want to know what what is a poem? I want you to share with us a, either your latest poem or or a poem that just is speaking to you right now. I encourage yeah. everybody to go see the or the do um, the poet delayed. You can see, get that podcast on every pretty much yeah. every platform. Apple right? podcast. Yeah. It's such a great podcast because you just take each episode is kind of based and modeled around one of your poems. Yeah. And so all these great conversations that are so poetic because they come from one of your poems. I think it's such a great uh, and unique way of having conversations. I love it. Well, thank you. I, I think for me, let's see. Um, this one I wrote recently is called on being a river. Mm, yes. And it, for me, it, it just kind of defines like what I need to be doing, just how, how it's a, it's a, it's a formula, I think, or just, it goes back to what we've been talking about, knowing who you are Mm -hmm. and being yourself. And it says, let me read it to you here. So on being a river, part one, apotheosis, which is like reaching your pinnacle, almost like becoming godlike. Okay. So it says, it it reads, Flow like a river of living waters, dynamic and full of power. Flow and cut your own course as you go, like the wild ancient rivers, untamed and sovereign, transforming the world around them. And like them, roar in your own shallows, be still in your own depths, and move aside the boulders and and sandbars that seek to block you or turn you back. Break them apart, dissolve them, make them part of you. And when you receive... When you become full, swell beyond your bounds and replenish the barren hearts. Enrich the wilting minds that lie in your floodplains. Flow like the ancient rivers that were sovereign and became holy. Part two, debasement, Sequana, which is the goddess name of the river San. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. She was holy once but flows now as a river of dead water, barren and unfeeling, through the city of lights. And her shores, made impermeable by men who tamed and dispossessed her, tower above like prison walls, whose stones make certain her course, and also blunt her. She cuts no more. And on those walls, those unnatural banks, men built cathedrals of stone and monuments of steel to God and mammon. And her body once worshipped, floats continually now, bloated and glassy-eyed, past those monuments and past those cathedrals with their petrified demons who keep watch with their big eyes that never sleep as she passes, like a funeral procession with no mourners. She was holy once in ancient times and sovereign, but she moves now in captivity, blunted and resigned. Epilogue. Be dynamic and full of power, and be sharp always, ready to cut your own course. Then flow like the holy rivers in ancient times that brought vitality to the earth and men to their knees in reverence and awe. Mm. I don't know that that's, the meaning of that is disguised very well. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, be who you are. Yeah. Be yourself, your authentic, true self, and don't. Let other people 
turn you into who they want or need you to be so that they can use you to build things on your mm-hmm. on your shore you know mm-hmm. make you who, make you who they want you to be and then yes m- manipulate and take advantage of you tell me what wholeness means to you wholeness to me um i think it's being who you are mm. in the moment and you know we kind of discussed this a little bit it it's not a, a destination necessarily mm-hmm. it's not i've arrived at wholeness right. it's you know where am i right now in this moment mm-hmm. um do i have an awareness about myself mm-hmm. about my feelings um am i open to mm-hmm. what's the emotions that i'm feeling mm-hmm. that's what i think wholeness is because i i, I think it's just having awareness and about yourself where you are in the moment and an acceptance of this is what it is. Mm. You know, we, we, we mentioned, we talked to my podcast episode about you know, the question, how are you? Mm-hmm. Um, just right. Mm. I am, I am how I am right now. That's what, you know, and I know that and I accept that. And so what am I going to do? Mm. That's what I think wholeness is for me. We invite you to the wholenessnetwork.com where you'll find the wholeness library. Inside, you'll find tutorials, downloads, mini classes, and all sorts of streaming content for you on your wholeness journey.